Hey, good evening, everybody. Uh, we're going to get started here in a moment. I'm hoping to see some people come on. I want to talk about something that I feel like is important and and um, just interesting of how when I have an opportunity to start to talk to churches, we see this more and more. So this is something we talked about before, and we're going to be talking about it again. And it is just something that really needs to be looked at, and we need to start getting prepared for it. So we're going to wait for another minute and get started. We got people uh, logging in right now. I know that we changed the time to eight. I'm hoping that um, that everybody uh, comes online at eight. If not, then uh, if they come out on eight thirty, we'll be we'll we're recording this, and so we will be able to share this with them later on. So we're going to get started here in just a minute. Hey, good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming out on this uh, really here in Florida, this beautiful uh, July uh, uh, evening. Um, I I wanted to come and talk about Matthew seven fifteen because we're seeing this more and more and more, and it is just one of I I I had ta I've talked about this before. I've talked about this on multiple occasions, but Matthew seven fifteen says, "Watch out for false prophets." They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. Um, I, Jessica and I were talking about this tonight, and I just happened to be at a meeting where a pastor of a large church, which kind of took me by surprise because he normally doesn't talk about things like this, started opening up to me about people coming into the church that had their own agenda or their own version of the Bible that they want to uh, teach. And he says, I'm not really for sure how we deal with this, except that we tell them that this is what our church teaches. But yet, a lot of times, they seem to get a following. And it is something that has started to concern us, because in our church just recently, uh, we had a pastor. Now, this was not a false prophet pastor. He taught the word, but he ran into um, some difficulties at home. And when the church asked him to kind of step aside for a while, uh, let somebody else run his class, uh, he became angry, left, and sent out an email to 123 people talking about how our church teaches false teachings. Now, at that moment in time, he kind of became a false prophet to me, but he tried his best to get these 120 some odd people on his side to cause issues at the church. So we really, I, it, it's just one of these things that we, we're going to talk about this and mental illness and kind of put them all together. And so when we're looking at this and when we're talking about the false prophets, they are coming into your church. And I'll give you an example of what we had happen at our church. And um, we had a we had a gentleman that was in our Monday night crew. Um, and I, 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 I like I said, I think we have to be careful of how we describe it, because 
he was very biblically knowledgeable knowledge he had he, his theology was off the chart i mean he his education on this was very good but then when he we got into a subject and this was about the holy ghost and of course in our group you have to understand we're a non-denominational church now we're not evangelical but there are members that come to our church that are it's never been an issue it's never brought an ugly side to it, uh, not an ugly side. Let me rephrase that. It's never brought a situation to where we've had to go to them and say, Hey, listen, we're not that type of church. Now we do have people that maybe dance in their seats or, or, or dance, you know, as the music's playing and things like that. But our church is not a church of speaking in tongues. And so this became the issue. This became the, the, the conversation and this guy just came out and said, you know, uh, speaking in tongues, you don't have to do it anymore because Paul talked about it. And that if you do do it, then what you're doing is you're changing the Bible. And of course, we know in Revelations, it says, if anybody changes the Bible, woe to, woe to them. Well, I had to pull the guy aside because that's really, I mean, I, I'm never going to put the Holy Spirit in a box. I'm never going to say that speaking in tongues can't happen. I look at it a completely different way. I don't look at it as a way that a lot of other people do. But here's the thing. Here's the thing. We get away from the basic gospel when we start to get into our philosophies or our thoughts or the way that maybe a church that we went to uh, was before, and now you're coming into this church and you want to change the 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 teachings of this church to the teaching that you came to and when you call discord well i think you're getting close into that false prophet or that wolf in sheep clothing because you kind of when you walk into a church you have to understand that they have their beliefs i mean we, we're seeing it every day the southern baptist convention just here recently saddleback church dropped uh was was kind of like I don't want to say kicked out, but was removed from the Southern Baptist Convention because Saddleback believes in having female pastors. Well, I, I, I'm not going to get upset over that. I mean, I know what Paul's teachings are, and I, and I was talking to uh, Kevin Haggerty, my good buddy today, and we were talking about how, you know, those those uh, descriptions that Paul talked about has caused so much controversy. I want to get back to the gospel and what the gospel is. The gospel is that Jesus, uh, uh, you know, God sent his son to die for us, and he is the way, the truth, and the light, life to the Father. He's the only way to the Father, and let's stick with that. And these other things that are on the outside that are important, do not think for one second. I do not think these things are important. And if your church believes one way or the other, that's the philosophy of the church as long as they don't walk away from the gospel. There are churches, and our church is one, that says that baptism is a part of the conversion. Baptism is part of salvation. Well, I, I kind of have a little concern with that. And I went to my pastor and talked to him. I said, how do you say when a person is laying on their deathbed and they say they, 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 their last breath is their family members are leaning over and praying over them, and they want them to accept Christ, and they accept Christ right there on the bed— how do you say that this salvation did not happen? My pastor was very smart in his response. He said, that's way above my pay grade. He said, I would never, ever tell a person that they're not saved because they have not been baptized because they believe in Jesus Christ. So when we had these people that come in, we had one that came in uh, three months ago that he was upset because the pastor had his wife on the stage and they were talking about parenting and she should not have been on the stage when there were men in the congregation. Wow. I mean, he got literally, uh, you know, visibly upset because of what had happened. And yet it, he took completely away from what the sermon was all about. And it was about parenting. They were talking about where in the Bible it talks about parenting. They were talking about their faults, things that they had failed at. They felt they they felt they failed that. So it was it was just very strange that this guy just went off on something as simple as that and did not listen to what was actually being spoken about. 
Now, we've had others that uh, my daughter was in a class, and she said a guy walked in, and they were talking about Christ and the death and the resurrection, and he kind of raised his hand, and he says, you know, that's 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 folklore. That's That's really not true. And besides, we should be looking at all religions because all religions have something to offer. Well, the youth leader immediately cut this guy off and said, listen, if you and I want to discuss this later on, we can't. Later on, he tried to pass out tracts about different religions, and the youth minister had to once again step in and say, stop it. You can't do this. Once again, this is what we're looking at, a false prophet. So the other night, I mean, this is, how, this is just how weird, kind of bizarre this is getting. I got a call from a member, at, a safety team member at Lakeview Church, and she said that in their study, they had a Wednesday night study, a guy showed up at the door, walked in and said that he was the fourth horseman, and that his name was Pestilence. Well, if you read John, uh, Revelation, uh, John talked about the, the horseman, and Pestilence wasn't even a name of one of the horsemen. It was, uh, you know, the fourth horseman, uh, the fourth and final horseman is green, upon it rides death, accompanied by Hades, you know. So it was when she said this guy said this, they're thinking to themselves, how do they respond to this? How do they respond to this? And so I, I, you know, being kind of quick when she said it, I said, you know, first off, I really don't know how to respond if I was standing there. But I would look at this person and say, listen, if you really feel that you're one of the horsemen, then that means the time is short and we need to be out here witnessing to as many people as we possibly can. So let's get busy, get working on trying to, you know, bring as many people to the kingdom as the Holy Spirit will put in front of us and we can do. So anyway, it just it it it, it just one of these things where that leads more toward, and this is what I think we're seeing more than anything else, and that's the mental illness. And we've talked about this. We've talked about this over and over and over again. We had a guy that came into our church this weekend, and uh I, I he was over six four, six five. I mean, he was huge. He had a really long beard, and he was walking around carrying a guitar case. Now, not carrying a guitar case by its handle. He was carrying it like you would a child under his arm, over his shoulder. I mean, or a rifle. I should say a rifle, not a child. Under his arm, over his shoulder. He was carrying this around, just in a weird way. So, of course we have the policy that we go and we talk to these people as soon as they walk in the door. Can I help you? Uh, I've never seen you. I mean, nobody had ever seen this guy before. So it's just, uh, can I help you? And one of our uh, members of the church went over and started talking to this guy and got as much information as he could from him. And he came back over and he said, the guy is, um, uh, he's, he's a, he's a vet. He's a, a military vet. He's been on four deployments overseas and that he, you know, this, this carrying around this guitar case is his security blanket and he's looking for a room that he can go into and play so that, you know, his PTSD is, is, is kind of, he calms himself down. How do you deal with this? I mean, what is it? Pasco County was on scene. It was on, on the, on the property they kept an eye on the guy the whole time he was there. He got a coffee, went and sat, did not go into the worship service, sat outside the whole time. Later on, we found out, because we have this soccer field on our campus, and there were coaches that were coming and trying to talk to young girls about being on their, their soccer team. And so we found out that he was, uh, his daughter was uh, trying out for the soccer. But he came over to the church and sat inside the our uh, gathering, but it was just, it was a, I mean, the rest of the day, people were coming to me going, hey, do you see the big guy over there with the guitar case? Well, of course we do. You know, we're paying attention. We've already talked to him, but he caused people concern because like when we teach, he was that anomaly. But we're seeing a lot of mental health issues out here where if you... Gosh, if you just listen to what is happening in the world, it just seems like everything that is on this page right here is something that we see. Solitude. We have students. We have people that just come into the church and are by themselves. 
worry, distraught, fear, loneliness, depression, all these different things that we're seeing. And guess who they're coming to? They're coming to the churches. And why is that? Because I one of one of the guys that's our, at our church called me on the phone. And, and, well, he sent me a text, and the text message was basically, I've had enough, and I'm thinking of just ending it. And I immediately called him and said, I'm calling local law enforcement and having a welfare check. And he got mad at me. He got mad at me. He started to yell at me about, you don't understand what goes on here. You know, it's $3,000 when you get taken in on, uh, you know, a Baker Act. All these different things that happen. It's just really sad. You know, you just don't understand. You, you don't really care if you're thinking you're helping me and all this stuff. So I was like asking him, what? you need to go talk to somebody now. And he says, I can't afford it. So, of course, then there's the issue of people can't afford mental health uh, help. And so what do they do? They come to the churches and they're going to be coming and talking to you. Uh, John uh, called me from New Day Church and was telling me about a guy that they've had that's been coming to their church for a while and that he um, he would come in and not bother anybody. He would sit down. He had notebooks. He would write notes. And he just was a little strange, but he was this person that we're talking about in solitude. You know, he didn't talk to a lot of people. John had created a rapport with him and would talk to him and have conversations with him. But the whole time he seemed to be by himself. He did appear to have some sort of, of, of mental uh, illness. And so John, like I said, they just watched him. They never had any problems with him. They didn't see anything wrong with him, but they just kept an eye on him. John comes in one day. He does not have his notebooks that he usually carries with him. He's very distraught. John tries to talk to him. He goes outside. John walks outside with him, kind of talks to him. He, they've got like a prayer uh, bench where you can go out and pray. The guy goes out into that area. And he, he just, he, he's just beside himself and John continues to talk to him. Well, John notices that he takes off his sunglasses and his watch or bracelet and leaves it on the bench and starts heading back toward the church. Well, in my book, that's a red flag that this person is about to do something uh, violent, about to do something to cause a scene. So John says that he's fortunate because one of their deputies had showed up. They asked the deputy to go over and talk to him. He went over to talk to him. The next thing you know, they're Baker acting the guy because he says he's been hearing Satan talk to him. And Satan had told him to throw away his wallet because he's getting ready to, Satan's getting ready to tell him to do something, which he, that after it's over with, you don't want your wallet on you because people won't know who you are. He took his stuff off outside, which is stuff that he is, is property that is really, um, you know, uh, important to him. And he took it off because he didn't want it hurt or torn up or things like that. These, these are the red signs that we're seeing. And he's hearing words from Satan. So mental illness is out here. The guy with the four horsemen, that's just mental illness. That's a delusion. That, that's something that, that we really have to be paying attention to because we don't know when these people may become so upset that they do something where we're hearing about it in the news. When we look at the Nashville shooting, the shooter there was uh, had mental illness issues. People talked about it. She wrote letters. She wrote notes. We still do not have the 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 manifesto that she had or the uh, notes that she was writing, her her diaries or anything like that. Because the thing of it is, is we're going to see that there's a lot of that in there, and we need to be paying attention. And mental illness is going to show up at the churches. It just is. I, I, I was talking to a uh, lady that runs a uh, psychiatric care uh, facility, and I, I was given a presentation today. Let me back up. I was given a presentation today, and it was on church safety. And the person asked me at the end, what is the biggest thing that we see right now in our churches? And I said, mental health issues. And she was sitting right there, and she shook her head. And I, and as I said, they, a lot of times will go to the church first before they'll try to get help, professional help outside, hoping that they may see something, hoping that they may get something, hoping that somebody may, it, it, it could just be listening. I mean, I saw this, I found this, this post and it just, it just tore me up. But this post says, you know, uh, 
he says, okay, everyone, it's prayer time again. I've decided not to pursue help or to go see a therapist or counselor for my bipolar and depression issues. So I've decided that I am ready to give up and I really don't want to talk to anyone about it or what's going on. I would rather be six feet under the ground in a concrete box with dirt pouring on me so I, can, I could not breathe anymore. That's wish maybe one day home from work this week anyway. He goes on to say, uh, down at the bottom, it says, uh, I'll be heading to Lake Grapevine soon. We'll see what happens. Of course, I look at this one and see a cry for help. I do see a cry for help. And I see that maybe at this point in time, we would reach out to that person or try to reach out to that person. Of course, we would get local law enforcement to get to the location that they say that they're going to. But these are things that I, I really am telling you, we're going to start seeing this more and more in the church. 9-11 brought it out. We talked about that a while back. There were people who lost everything. There were people who lost family members. There were people who lost their businesses. All these different things because of 9-11. There were also people that we saw that felt like the uh, COVID-19 was nothing more than a governmental conspiracy. And of course, that's just spreading. I mean, I don't care what you believe on that but you don't bring it into the church and start talking about it in the church. There were others that felt like COVID-19 was the worst thing that ever happened as far as a virus. And still to this day, we have people in our church that wear masks. I'm not going to go to them and tell them I don't believe that, but we still see it. We see these type of things that are happening in the church. So we as safety team members need to start getting ready for this. We need to be praying that the Holy Spirit will help us anytime we walk into one of these situations. It's just like I was telling you, if somebody walked in and said they were one of the horsemen, I would tell them that tells me that the end is near and we need to be busy. So how can I help you save so help, get people to get into a relationship with Christ? This is what I would be working on. Now, I will say that we, uh, we do have a training on mental health and the church, and we just we feel like that this is something that needs to be talked about more and more. So if you're interested in calling us, contacting us, or having us come out and talk about this, we'd be more than happy. I am continuously getting more calls, it seems like, from churches with incidents where people are false prophets to where they, um, they, they uh, uh, you know, believe that your church is teaching the wrong thing. Uh, one of the churches that I'm associated with, I meet with some of their members on Tuesday morning. They had some guys that came out and protested in front of their church because they said their church was not pro-life, that they were baby killers and all these different things like that. Well, the church that they were speaking with, I know is very much pro-life because they have a whole complete ministry that goes out to pregnancy centers and 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 stand out on the street corner and try to talk to people about Christ. I will say that I have seen their group out before, and they're not standing there screaming at people like this group was doing in front of this church. So there's just a lot going on. It's really sad because I feel like we have a lot of things that we need to be concentrating on, we need to be paying attention to. And this right here could easily, like the, the, the false prophets or the mental health issues, could really hurt your church. We just have to be aware that it's out here. And whatever we can do, whatever we can do, because it's a part of verbal de-escalation, it's a part of trusting the Spirit, it's a part of just being in God's will at that time when that person walks up. I'll never forget when I was a police officer that uh, I was working with a guy that was so quick, it was unreal. So one night we were out walking uh, one of the beats, and this guy came up, full beard, he was a street person, lived on the street, all these things like this. And he walked up and he went, he came right to us and he said, he said, he said, officers, he said, my name is Frank Serpico and I'm undercover right now. Well, if you know who Serpico is, it's a movie that was done uh, about a New York policeman that was straight, would not, would not take bribes, all these different things like that. And the first thing that came to my mind, because I hadn't been on the department that long was, oh my gosh, what a, what a crazy person right here in front of us. The guy that I was with, Chuck Severance was his name, stuck his, immediately stuck his hand out and grabbed the other guy's, uh, the, the Frank Serpico's hand, started shaking it feverishly, saying, oh my gosh, you're one of my heroes. 
is there anything that we can do to help you with your investigation? <laughs> the guy didn't know what to do, had no clue. It took him by such surprise that he goes, no, no, I'm fine. Uh, uh, thank you very much. And, and ha have a good night and walked off. And Chuck kind of looked at me and says that, that that's what you got to do with this. You just got to talk to them. They believe in something that you might not agree with. These people that come in with mental health issues or as false prophets, the best thing to do is just talk to them, tell them maybe this isn't the church you should be going to. One of our pastors had a guy that came in and was just really ripping him about our teachings in the church and that we were not right. And he tried to convince him that, you know, this is what we teach. This is how we're going to go. And I looked at him and I said, why didn't you just look at this guy and say, hey, maybe we're not the church for you. There's a Methodist church down the street. There's another church over on the corner. You can't throw a rock in our neighborhood without hitting the church. And he goes, you know, he says, I guess we as pastors just want to try to change these people. And it's really not working, is it? And I go, no, it's not, because he's going to go find someplace else to do the same thing. So anyway, I think we need to be paying attention to this. I think we need to be watching for this. This is one of the things that we're going to be talking about more and more, especially when we get these situations where churches call us and tell us of something that has happened at their church. So I'm going to open it up. If anybody got, has any questions, um, I don't know if Jessica made it. Jessica's up in Iowa right now, and they had a really bad rainstorm. And she was, okay, Jessica has raised her hand. So let me, um, she's here. So I'm going to promote her to a panelist. John, I, I see you're on, and I was talking about the guy that you were uh, dealing with. Do you have any more information on? I'm going to allow you to talk. Do you have any more information on that? You got to unmute you. You're muted. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, please. Okay. The, uh, the guy that we were talking about, um, he was uh, Baker acted and I followed through with the police officer and the wallet that they found in the garbage can in our church had all his identification and they had gotten in touch with family up North in Iowa, which is where he came from. He came down here after the hurricane to do roofing um, he was bipolar, schizophrenic, uh, ran out of his meds. And that's when he started, you know, going, going crazy, but evidently family members had come down and taken him back home. So I'm hoping and praying that, uh, they got him online with, uh, with his medication and everything. Well, that's what we can hope for. I mean, we, we want to see these people live lives, uh, you know, and, and the one gentleman that I was talking about that had called, uh, had texted me and it, I mean, it sounded like he was thinking of suicide. He holds a job. He has a family. I mean, you, when you talk to him and get to know him, you can kind of see some of the things that go on, but he's, he's doing, he's living a normal life and the medication is what helps. Uh, my sister-in-law is bipolar and is on medication and does well. And so we know that there are things out here that help them, but it's just like you said, when they get off the medication, uh, I've heard so many people tell me that when they get off the medication, that their whole disposition changes. And sometimes they become violent. Sometimes they do other things. So it's just, you know, we have to be ready and prepared. So. Jim, um, yes. Ryan, business, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Yes. Uh, I had this uh, guy working for me, came from uh, tennis, uh, Kentucky. And, um, you know, he, he, was, he was good at what he did. But then I started to notice that uh, there were mood changes going on. And he finally admitted that he was bipolar and schizophrenic and a few other things. And he was off his medicine. So um, he would get violent. And I had to actually fire him because he was going to have the cis fight with one of the people that he was in the house changing out a hot water heater with. Well, he ended up getting violent one night and beat his wife up, beat his brother up, um, attacked the cop when he got to the house and then attacked the EMT when he came to his house. So they put him in jail for um, two and a half 
years. Wow. And he came out, he was homeless for uh, about three months. And I knew he was going to try to get in touch with me because when he got uh, jailed, he called me 23 times. He oh, wanted wow. me to. And uh, he ended up committing suicide. Mm. So the, the medication, he, he was like night and day. If he was on a medication, right. okay. If he was off it, and I finally convinced him to carry the medication. So when he came to work, if I noticed it, I say, you know, Jim, did you take your meds? Oh, no, I forgot. Well, then he could take them. But otherwise, it would be a hard day for he and I. Right. I understand when people have those problems, but the medication uh, definitely uh, helped this guy out. She was a doctor. John, you're moving in and out of the, the speaker, the microphone. Yeah, you know what? I'm, I'm probably putting my finger in it. <laughs> <laughs> I actually got him to come to church a few times. And uh, he was loving it. He uh, actually got in, in touch with our um, maintenance man and did some ma maintenance there. But again, he stopped his medicine and he said, right. I don't need medicine anymore. But that's right. not true. So no. medication yeah. is a big thing with these guys. Well, thanks. I appreciate it. Anybody else got anything? Jess, did you have anything to add? I did not have anything to add. No, and I'm not seeing anything in the chat or in the Q and a. Okay. All right. Real quick. We'll go through these. Uh, we have some training that's coming up. Uh, we have a new church that we're going to be going to. It is Oakwood church. Uh, we'll be there on August the 26th uh, from 8 AM to 12 PM. It's located at 11209 Casey road in Tampa. The doors will open at 7 30 AM. Now, this is, this is how we can come to your church if you're interested in us coming to your church with little or no cost to the church. It's a $25 cost, but it includes refreshment and a gift that's worth $20. USCCA will be there. Um, the gift is my book. I'm just going to tell you what it is. I don't know why Wendy puts a gift. Uh, some of y'all might not see it as a gift, but uh, we give give away a book uh, for you coming. So you get something in return, but at least you put something, you put some skin in the game because we see it so often that when it's free event, people just don't come if it's a nice day outside. You put money in there, a lot of times you show up. USCCA will be there. Uh, they help us out. With their, we're, like I said, we've sponsored with them. We've jumped in with them. And uh, it's a great organization. So they will be there to help us out. We also have another event coming up and this is in October. This is, uh, we're doing, uh, finally the church and, and uh, all of us are getting together to do a book signing event. And if you're in the neighborhood or close by, it would be really great to see you there. Uh, we're going to be, uh, having some, uh, refreshments and things like this and a good time to, to do just some fellowship. So if you are in the area, we're going to be posting more about this. It's Friday, October the 6th, between 6 uh, p.m. and 8, 8 p.m. And uh, we're just looking forward to getting uh, together with our friends. Our next member-only uh, Zoom meeting is July the 20th, which is next week. So I'm looking forward to seeing y'all and talking. And plus, if you're online tonight and you're going to be with us next week, Start thinking about some of the issues that you're having at your church right now so that we can discuss this so that we, we have something to talk about. Because I really, truly get tired of just doing the talking. Y'all need to help me out with this. Y'all have a lot of stuff going on in your churches. You may not think it's important, but once you talk, you may find out that other churches are going through the same thing that you're going through. Once again, if you carry, and of course, now we have the constitutional carry, which of course, a lot of churches, is, they're kind of freaking out about, but I, I will, we could talk about this, could, this could be something that we still could talk about, but it's one of these things of, do you have any procedures or policies and procedures in your church on how you deal with people that come in with a firearm on them? Because if you don't, then how are you going to walk up and talk to somebody that you have never seen before, but you notice that they have a gun. What is the way that you're going to handle it? I know the way that we handle it. We go up to that person and tell them, look, 
we are a constitutional carry church. We're a Second Amendment church. We have no problem with that. But if there were a shooting inside this church and you were to pull your weapon, you become a target because we do not know you. We have safety team members that are in the church that are trained to handle it. So we just want to let you know right now that this is probably not, you know, a place that you should be pulling your weapon. Now, at that point in time, you need to be watching body language and you need to have somebody standing there backing you up just to make sure that nothing goes wrong. But you need to talk to these people. And we can we can talk about that on another date. So receive a copy of the book. Uh, it's really a $20 donation. Go to trinitysecurityallies.com. There's still free resources out there. We should be putting some others out there soon. Hopefully, I'm working with Jessica. Y'all get on Jessica to tell her to help me with this because she's very talented. If you've noticed, if you're on Instagram, Facebook, uh, we're on Twitter also, Jess. You have us everywhere. Less so on Twitter, but definitely on Instagram and on Facebook. Uh, we are on, and then we're also working on the YouTube side of things as well. So we're, we're out here on social media. Okay, uh, go to Rumble. If you've never heard of Rumble, it's it's slowly but surely. We're getting big names out there right now, but they're starting to, it, it's pushing toward trying to replace YouTube because of just the censorship that YouTube does on certain things that we talk about. Today, we talked about how the, the new movie that's out uh, on freedom, on, on human trafficking, how all these different newspaper articles were calling this a QAnon movie. And so we talked about that today because uh, next week, we I mean, the next time we're out here talking, I might do a test. And this test would tell me whether or not you're a QAnon person or not. So just, just to let you know that even though they say it's a nasty word, uh, I, and, and <laughs> let's be perfectly clear here. I'm not pushing conspiracies or QAnon. I just think it's very funny how some of the things that QAnon believe in, I believe in also, but it's because I look at the world in a different view and I look at it through a Christian view. So we'll, we'll talk about that. That's a little tongue in cheek there. It, 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 but like I said, we, we are, we, we are uh, uh, out there on rumble. So just, to let you know that anytime you want to come out, we're out there, True Christian Talk, you have to join. If you go out and it asks for you uh, to uh, put in somebody to sponsor you, because sometimes they even do that. We've had that happen. Uh, shoot me a text. You all have my telephone number because every single email that I send out or Jessica sends out, there's a telephone number on it. Text us and we'll get you, uh, we'll get you in. I want to thank everybody for coming out. Unless there's something out, I'm going to let y'all go. Thanks for being here. Um, I really, I miss y'all. Uh, I'm hoping that we can get to some churches down. I know that we're going to come down south again. We've got a new church that wants us. So, John, as soon as that happens, I know that that uh, we'll be coming your way. Uh, Bob, I know that we'll be coming your way also. Uh, uh, so, uh, look for it. Uh, we'll be sending stuff out. Y'all be safe please, and be blessed. Thank you.